So in this video, we are going to talk about the most common question that we get as a app development agency, as an app development shop, as developers, and that's how, how much we, does it cost to build an app? Yep. So just to go into our background, why we, why, why do we get this question? So we're the Tech Twins and we've been in business building applications since 2009. Uh, we've built well over 400 applications for companies, Fortune 100 companies to startups and, and a couple of our apps actually were acquired. Um, so we've been building applications as a more on the tech entrepreneur side, like as a leader of tech applications. Now, yeah. we started off, we didn't always start that way. We started off as developers, you know, developing, and then we became more on the business side, doing business analyst work, and then we moved to project management work, and then we owning our owning our own agency have done a lot of different types of apps across the years. Yeah, so we've we've done it all. We've done it from big apps all the way to small apps, and every app in between. We worked with teams where it's just. Us as a developer had one developer to teams that had 20, 30 people on the team. So it ranges. And the question now becomes, how much does it cost to do that? Like, how much does it cost to if get you have to the nitty -gritty. one person? How much does it cost if you do it overseas? Is that really beneficial? How much does, why, why do people, people even have 50 people on the team to work on the app? It doesn't make sense or does it? <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's go deep into the question because a lot of you guys out there are, I know you're, you're, you're definitely salivating at the, at the, at the, at the mouth of, of what we have. And we're going to give you n nothing holding licking held your, back. Licking your lips like you LL Cool J. Yeah. So we're going <laughs> to do nothing held back and we're going to give you everything that we know about the process of what this looks like. All right. So Troy, somebody right. comes up and says to you, okay, bro, I'm thinking I got an app idea. How much it costs to build an app? Well, I think I think the first answer that I will always give is it depends. Um, <laughs> it depends. And it's like this. It's like if somebody came to you and said, how much it costs to build a house? Then the same answer our architect is going to say is it depends how many bedrooms you have. Yep. How, what's the is, what's the ground, the countertops? What's the finish? It is do you want hardwood floor? Do you want laminate? Like to give me more information is basically always yep. going to be the answer. Yeah. And it depends on a, a lot of different factors. OK. I mean, you, if you come to me as a, a billion dollar company yeah. with current clients underneath your belt, then that's a whole different ballpark on estimating how much your app costs because you have, you're an enterprise level company. You have 50 plus clients. Uh, you know where to find the clients. You don't have to worry about marketing because you already have a marketing and sales system in place. Then that's a whole different conversation than if you were just one person. You only have ten thousand dollars to your name right now, uh, and you're trying to build an application, which is you think is the biggest idea with no clients whatsoever. Yeah. And it all comes down to one word in my eyes, and that's risk. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, two words. I mentioned the second word. Word in a second is how much of a risk to you is building that application. Yeah, and that determines how much it does it cost. If I'm a person who is one person and I only, uh, you know, I got a nine to five job, I only have $10,000 in the bank, then me putting up $50,000 is a huge risk. But if I'm a billion dollar company or a mid-sized company, then me putting up $50,000 is minuscule. Uh, and that's a lesser of a risk. So trying to evaluate those different things is very important to determine how much the app, does the app cost. Yeah. So I think, uh, so my question is, okay, the, we're talking about risk here, and um, is it really riskier for a company to put up three, five million dollars than a, a startup to put up five thousand dollars? Like, which one's riskier? Like, and what is risk? Like, explain, dig, get deeper into what's, what's the actual risk? Well, uh, to me, I think risk is how quickly are you going to get a return on investment? And that's the second word, I think. Because yeah. my second risk word is return. And return go hand in hand. Risk and return. Um, so if I, yeah. if, if I am less likely to get my return of investment, then it's riskier. 
uh, if I am less likely to get a reward, I mean, as, you know, return a reward uh, and get it quickly, then yes, it's, it's a much riskier process. So risk determines. And if I and, and if I'm more likely to lose the money, I not yep. just get the re- re- return, but if I'm more likely to lose the money, that's a riskier, right? Yep. I'm more likely to lose it. So like, I know I'm not a gambler. But, you know, gambling on a slot machine where there's you only have a 10 percent chance to get a return, that's a lot riskier than playing blackjack, which may be a 40 percent return. So a lot of people decide to play blackjack. Yeah. And if I have more cash outlay, right, cash, cash on hand, then that is it's a less risky process than if I had no cash at all. Right. So if I had a million dollars in the bank, then me putting up fifty thousand dollars is less riskier than me having ten thousand dollars and putting up fifty thousand dollars. So let's 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 bring this back to how much does an app cost? No, the question's still there. Um because like I understand that if, if I only got ten thousand dollars to put towards an app, I only got one thousand dollars put towards the app, you're basically saying that like depending on the app idea like what's going to be returned on that thousand dollars? Is that what you're saying? And then what's the likelihood I'm going to lose it based on my resources, based on, um, you know, my expertise, based on the market, based on there's so many different factors that determine like whether you're going to get a return or not. If you invest in an app yeah. concept and an app idea. So talk through those factors. Like, like, man, let's get deeper. Like what, what is, the factors that causes app development to be risky. Like from a team standpoint, not we we're talking about money because the money's gonna buy this stuff, right? So money's gonna buy the team. Money money is money's risk. gonna like market, like talk talk through some of what makes the, the app idea and concept risky. So so you have money, okay. um, but then you also have current cl- cl- clients. Yeah. So current customers. So if I have 50 enterprise customers trying to, that really want this application. They give me, already given me a million dollars a year. Yeah. Then I have 50 million dollars in revenue. That is a less riskier process. Even if I put up two million dollars. So, cause I know so. I have an increase of, I already have my existing customer, customer base. So even though I put up two million dollars, that is less of a risk than having zero customers and putting up ten thousand dollars. Oh, so let me let me bring it home because you threw some numbers out there, and I I don't want the numbers to confuse the no, audience. Yeah, we don't want you to get lost. In the <laughs> we don't sauce. get you lost in the sauce of the numbers. <laughs> You're saying that if you have existing customers, an enterprise client can spend millions because they have existing customers that can already know, like, and trust them, so that when they release an app, they can spend more because they know. There's a better opportunity for a return because if people know I can trust me, they willing to do more yeah. business with me because they're already doing business. And then that's a less risk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and and speaking of return, then you you return also is based on time, right? I the even if I get fifty thousand dollars in two weeks after building an app versus say say a hundred thousand dollars in six months. Then the fifty thousand dollars in two weeks may make more sense. Okay. So return, even though the, the money is less, the the time in order to get that money is less, right? Yeah. So now <laughs> it's more of a higher return that's based on time as well. Yeah. So you got to think about a whole bunch of factors. You're thinking about risk uh, return when it comes down to how much money you're getting, or how much cash, or how much customers. But you're also thinking, how quickly can you get those customers coming in? And all those is evaluated when you're trying to calculate the budget of how much does the app cost. Then on top of that, Man. the other factor is people. Yeah. So we, we didn't even get to like, we were just talking high level. So high level. We're not even talking. We're we, not even getting We're going to give you the numbers. We're going to guarantee the numbers. We, yeah. We didn't even get to like, Oh man, because most people will, if you look at all the, any other re- guru out there and that say they build apps, they're going to say immediately, Oh, it, it matters of like the engineers, how many engineers, how many features, features, like how much the cost is per feature. 
That's not even where to start. Not even where to start. And that doesn't even, that doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. It's, okay. You just confused me. Why does it not? Because what matters the most is how quickly can you benefit the client? How, fit, how quickly can you get your customer and benefit the customer and keep the customer? And so, so you're telling me the product development, which is the engineers building the app and the actual business are not separate. They're intertwined. Intertwined. So intertwined. you're saying to me that the business side and the product development side, if the business side can reduce the risk by having already pre-existing customers, by having people that know, like, and trust them, by having a market audience that already exists, they can spend more money on the product development side because they know that they can get the return out. Yeah. Return meaning that if I spend a certain amount of money, I can get some revenue based on that money. Okay. All right. So, that's, okay. Yeah, so yeah. This, that's this, the, and that's ultimately the main factor right there. Then you start talking about, all right, where's the, what's the risk of product development, getting your product to market? Um, then that's where teams and where do you need to determine whether you have an in-person team versus a outsourced team that's overseas, uh, whether you need to have a building where you all collaborate together or whether you can just use Zoom. And those all determine the cost of application as well. Uh, processes, um, whether you, uh, how quickly you need to be talking to the developer, you need a project manager, you need a BA. You need all What's these a BA? One BA. A BA is a business analyst. So mm -hmm. their whole purpose is essentially to build out the, write out the, the feature set, uh, so that the developers can understand it. Yeah. So they're like building the, like if you're in building a house, they're essentially Building out maybe the bill of materials, the the, diag the uh, architecture diagram, yep. so that the, the developers who's building it can have a blueprint on what to work from. Yeah, blueprint mm -hmm. is is, is a, essentially a blueprint on how to get to from point A to point B on your application. Okay, okay, all right. So we went deep and we just named out the BA, and I just cut you off. But now you you opened up a doorway to now that you uh, if you understand that you can reduce risk by starting off. We call it market first, but starting off by having a, a, enough customers up front before you build the app is one way to reduce risk. But let's start talking about now that you, you got an app idea, you started to reach out and the way a startup would do this, where they would go out and start reaching out, building an audience with potential customers before they start building, right? Yeah. All right. And then now the question becomes, now that I have an audience, now that I've built it, how do I start pricing out my app from a development standpoint? Yeah. So now you want to be able to start creating that blueprint. Okay. Yeah. So, Create. so, so the blueprint, what is that? What does that blueprint do? A blueprint is essentially writing out the task to understand what it takes to build out your minimum viable product, your minimum amount of effort to be able to make sure the product is successful. Yeah, so I, I like to I like to sum it up as it's the minimum amount of resources to get the maximum return for your user. Yeah. Yeah. So and we're still going back to return because ultimately all of this is based on like how do I get the maximum amount of revenue for a certain amount of effort. Yeah. Right. So minimum effort, maximum value. Okay. Okay. So, so that blueprint. And so we, we go through and I know from the ultra accelerator standpoint. So we have an ultra accelerator framework that, that walks everybody through this entire process of how to get the maximum value with the minimum amount of resources. So if you're interested in that, schedule a call below. Shameless plug. Um, so what, what, does the discovery do it? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about because that's, that's my side, what I do in, my, in a business. Yeah. But Troy, if you had to sum it up, what is the, the discovery? It's discovery. That's the first step of blueprinting out. Discovery is the first step of blueprinting out those, the, the, uh, the beat, what the BA does and the requirements and so forth. What does that, what does that do for a company? Um, so to me, it's just a matter of, like you said, scoping out or understanding what the resources is to execute on the minimum viable product. So you have the, this, the feature set that you need and the resources in order to execute. And then you try to bridge the gap between 
how much time and effort it's going to take for these specific resources to execute on this feature set. Yeah. And a feature set can be, you know, a login page. It can be a specific feature of the app. You know, hey, I want my app to automatically test this, this person. That's a feature. So yeah. you really scoping out what that feature looks like and what, how much resources it's going to take to execute on those features. Yeah. So we, we, we like to think of it as a, a 90 day plan or a plan. It doesn't have to be 90 days, but it can be more than 90 days. Yeah. But it's a plan to actually get the return. <laughs> like, okay, now that we know what, what we, what we need to reduce the risk, how do I build a plan to get the return? What resources do I need to be able to build that? Because what money, what cost really is, is you're taking cash or equity and you're buying resources to fulfill the vision. Yeah. Right. So, um, talking about discovery a little bit further. So, Basically, the first step, and right now what we're going through, guys, is the process of how we determine the cost. Um, now that we understand, how do you understand that this is not a ball game of, of getting the cheapest that you can get is about getting the best return. All right. That's, that's the game you play. All right. So now we're talking about, okay, now that we understand the risk, how do I build a strategy to get the best return? Yeah. All right. So, the discovery is that strategy. And essentially the discovery is, is a document that has a couple of core elements. And this every, every development agency, freelancer, developer, team, development team, they all have a different, this looks very different from, from, from development, um, developer to developer. Ours is unique because we build it out in a way that's very iterative. Um, we do a very agile, approach to development and that's actually an agile methodology for the people who are familiar with it. Um, what we do is we look at your business not just from a what the technology would do from a feature by feature standpoint, but how does that relate to that return on investment? So we're looking at okay, what is the first set of features that you need to release that's co closely correlated with the problem that the audience is saying? Okay. We talk through, we do your project description. What's the architecture we, we need in order to scale to your first, your, to your first set of users? You know, whether that's if you have a goal to do a million users or two million or 10 million, what does that architecture look like? And we, we, when we say architecture, we're talking about what, um, coding, uh, Troy help me out with architecture, what coding frameworks, um, what, what systems, pro, um, servers, uh, you know, everything that you need in order to scale, scale your, scale your software. Yeah. Yeah. So you, what resources you need from a, I guess a hardware standpoint, you know, I may need some servers. I may need a system to kind of manage the servers. I may need some software. So these are all different hardware and software components that's needed to build out your application. Yeah, I mean, everybody, you, you, if you haven't heard of server, look it up, you know, uh, but essentially, um, you know, this is. Server is just simply somebody else's computer. Yeah, that's this is, this is. is, this essentially matters to the cost because the more traffic that's coming, it's generating, computer. the more traffic that's, that's, that's being generated through the app, the more the cost will be. Yeah. So those are things that, that we have to look at and, and make sure we can hold into account. Um, server costs can vary. Um, so this is the first resource that, that we're talking about. Yeah. And that, and that's factored into the cost. Yeah. Right? So you have human resources, a developer to build it out, but you also have technical resources, which is your server cost, um, it's monthly subscriptions, maybe to an email server to be able to send emails on your behalf. Yeah. It may be a, a test message server. It may be even your project management system that can be Jira or Trello or Asana, ClickUp, all these project management systems that we've used in the past. Yeah. And those all factored into the cost of building the application. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to go back to that discovery doc, I mean, it's, it's really about trying to figure out the best strategy, um, for, 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 for building your app. So we're looking at that, the architecture. We're looking at, we're listing out all the features that's in your application. We're prioritizing those features 
based on which feature is the best value to your customers. Because whatever that feature is, we call it the aha moment. Um, whatever that feature is, that gives you the best value. That's a feature you should be starting off first. Yeah. And that's probably the number one mistake that I see is that people use the buzzword MVP, minimum viable product. But ultimately, when they come to us, they thinking that this is the minimum viable product. But actually, the minimum viable product is probably this. And if you're not comfortable releasing that MVP, then you probably should go to your audience that you should have been building the reduce risk up front and then seeing what they say and seeing what the, their answer is and seeing if they're willing to pay for it, you know, ultimately. OK, yeah. so so in that step by step feature set that Travis just mentioned, you may have it may be divided upon by between different people based on uh, roles and responsibility. Let me, let me give you an example. Right. So I may be responsible for creating the designs. Then that may go to a designer. Yeah. Somebody else may re be responsible for creating the web portion of the application. That'll go to a web developer. Somebody else may be doing the servers and configuring the servers. That may be an IT back end developer. Somebody else may be doing, uh, just kind of testing. That's QA testing. Yeah. So you have these different roles and responsibilities of your human resources that you need to build it out. Oftentimes in a startup, those different responsibilities is consolidated to one person or two people. Yeah, which increases the risk. <laughs> increases the risk. Um, so that's why you will see in bigger companies that you will have those resources divided. I may have a QA tester. I may have a back end. Yep. Oh, yeah, quality insurance. Um, I may have a quality insurance tester. I may have a back end developer, a front end developer, a business analyst, a project manager. Uh, a lot of other desi a designer, a product owner, a scrum master. You may have 10, 15 different people working underneath one project because of the mere fact that now they only have that one responsibility, which reduces their risk as a company. Yeah. And, 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 and that, that's actually one of the sections of that discovery plan is team resources. Like if you, if you have a certain app, what does the team look like? And then, like Troy said, it varies. Uh, it can be an eight person team or it can be a 30 person team, depending on the complexity that you're trying to go for. And that's why we recommend scaling your, your feature set back is because we can build a team that's more lean up front. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so now, Troy, just, just tell, like, if, I, if I'm building, I'm going to use this as a house analogy, right? I'm building a house. And so now we understand that really you should have some type of plan. If you don't have that plan, then you should make one. And like I said, go to the ultra accelerator. Um, it'll create a 90 day plan for you. Um, and then you can figure out, okay, here's what I need to do to get there. But I'm building a house. Yeah. And you know, a lot of costs when you're building a house deals with the process of building a house, right? If you ever built a house, you got to lay the foundation, clear out the, you know, you first got to clear out the land, right? Remove the trees. Yep. The next thing is you got to spec out for the plumbing. Yep. And then after you spec out for the plumbing, and then you got to build the foundation on top of it, you know, after you build a foundation, you lay the front, like there's a process to building a house, yep. right? And every single one of those processes is a cost. And that's what makes a house the cost that it is. What's the process? To building a uh, building an app because the process matters. Like if you have a one process, then it could be a lot more expensive than something else. Like if I just have a guy and I just say, "Hey man, build this feature," that's a pro like, even though it's a bad process, that's a process. But if I say I got a set team that this goes through, like what's what's tell me true, what's the process? So <laughs> yeah, so the process is. Well, first of all, we go through a 4D process. <laughs> yep. Discovery, yep. Discovery, design, design, develop, develop, deploy, deploy. Yep. All right. And discovery is building out those requirements, building out those feature steps. The 90 day plan is giving you that plan to, to move step by step to build out your product. Yep. And Once we have those step by step items, we can then estimate the task in order to execute. So a developer will come in and say, hey, here's step number one. Uh, that's going to take me eight hours. Here's step number two. Oh, that's going to take me 16 hours. Step number three. Oh, that's going to be a little bit longer. And they, they go through step by step and estimate how much that costs. 
And once we do that, or how long it takes. And once we do that, we calculate how much it costs from that step-by-step -step plan. So it's crucial that that step-by-step -step plan really has every single step it takes to build out the application from a product level. And then Travis also take it even further to say, here's also the step-by-step -step plan to build it out on a marketing and sales, give you an entire product to market, product to market strategy or give you an entire blueprint on what is going on. And it's kind of similar yeah. to a house, right? I want to want to have, hey, you're going to build out this room, but not know how to build out the other room. You want yeah. the whole entire plan to build out the best house that you can. And that's what we will do on our end. Then from there, once we get that step by step plan that's still in discovery, we start moving into development and understanding what the resources are going to take to really build out this application. Yeah. So once we move into what well, we move to design, discovery. Oh, yeah. My bad. Yeah. yeah so we move into design. Yeah. So we get out the we we have a written version of the step by step, and then we started make a visual version of it. Yeah. And then that and we yeah, we call that mock up. So it go through this design process, mm -hmm. and then from there it, it then goes to the development. And then we eventually would also do the architecture and deploy it out as well. And so and why it's important is understanding that process because each process has a cost, right? Um, the discovery cost to build out that plan is a very different cost than your design cost to build out the user experience, right? This is how you get the maximum experience from, uh, from the user standpoint, the visuals, the actual what buttons do you click all the way down to the development cost of making it come to life. That's a different cost. And then the deployment cost is a very different cost. Yeah. And so understanding that process, we can, we can talk through kind of understanding the cost, right? Yeah. Um, essentially, uh, so I got a question you started mentioning about this team, right? Yeah. And a lot of people are asking, and I know they're thinking it, like, where do I, like, I've, I've heard a lot about outsourcing, right? Outsourcing to places like, Ukraine, India, Pakistan, like, and I, I've heard about that, the developers over there and in these big rooms cranking out code. What is the difference between a developer that's outsourced that may cost 20 to $80 per hour versus a developer that's in the States that may cost $200 an hour? Yeah. Right. Why is it that why is that cost so big? What are some of the things that you can do? What's the some of the risks of going overseas um, and, and talk? Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So inside of our process, we have both. Overseas developers and we have in-house developers and then we also have remote developers as well. Mm -hmm. So meaning that they are still in the United States, but they're, you know, maybe located remotely. So from a outsourced development standpoint, that increase what I will, I can perceive it as it, it will increase your risk. And what I mean by that is there are language gaps. Yeah, language gaps. Uh, there are What's the language gaps. What's that mean? Sometimes what they communicate to you is not is not what is intended. <laughs> yeah. And you have to go back and forth to be able to get a yeah. a good solid communication stream. Yeah. Uh, and, between that depends, and that depends on the and country. That cost. Right? Yeah, because like most some of the countries we're talking about, their first language isn't necessarily English. Yeah. Um and because of that, you know, they they may have some communication barriers that what we say doesn't come off what we meant and then they end up building something different. And if they build something wrong, we got to redo it and yep. it increases cost. Increases cost. Yeah. Okay. So that's a risk. Yep. I see. And in order to mitigate on that risk, a lot of times what we'll do is pair somebody who's highly technical as in-house as part of the team yep. to a yep. outsourced development team. So we'll have somebody that in the States that's, that's, that's working very, very closely, maybe even face to face with with, with the product owner, the person who's building the app. And then that person would then interface and translate almost like a tech, like a technical translator. Like yeah. they say what the business needs. And then they, they say that in a way that they know because they've done it over and over again. 
that the outsource developer needs. And then they make sure that there is a reduced risk of not having to rework. Yeah. And they essentially, their purpose is to ensure the quality of the code. Yeah. Make sure the code is scalable, meaning that if I were to pass this code off to another development team, they can jump in and not have a problem jumping in and working on it. Uh, as well as making sure that <laughs> it's not what we call spaghetti code. Yeah. Right. So a lot of times the code would be really unorganized too so much uh, to a point where it's really difficult to manage and maintain the code base. Yeah, I think I think a lot of a lot of people out there this that may be something that's that they may have not have thought of. Yeah, that's one of, that's um, actually a very common mis, mis mistake or misconception that a lot of people do. They'll just outsource it out, say, Oh, I got a developer overseas working on it and they're not even looking towards what this code is going to look like a year from now, two years from now, when I have a 30, 40, hopefully have a 30, 40 person team working on it. Is it uh, scalable enough where I can continue to reuse the code in such a way for scale? And you need somebody like a technical person paired up with the development team to, uh, to understand that. Yeah, I think. And so this is how this looks, because I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> um, so essentially, a customer comes to us, say, hey, I want to, I've been working with an overseas developer, um, and they, you know, they, they built me the first version of my app. I want you guys to take over the app. We go in, we take a look at the, open up the hood, you know, pull, pull back the curtains. Or walk into the house. And we look at it, and then we look at what they did, and it is impossible for us to understand what they did because they did some things that isn't the standard way of coding, uh, you know, so they may have, you know, threw it together, right? And we can't understand what what was being done. Yeah. And then what happens in that case? What do we do? With yeah. So, so first of all, that to add on to his analogy, I say like walking the house, I'm going to use the house analogy. Yeah. Imagine you looking at the house, the house looks beautiful on the outside. And it's com that's commonly what happens when you're looking at an app. Yeah, it, it, you know, it, it works well. But then when you walk into the house and look at the inner workings, you realize that you have to walk through the living room and the kitchen to get to the bathroom. Or you got to walk, walk through the bathroom to get to the bedroom. And it's just not making sense to you. And that's oftentimes what happens when you're not managing the code base yeah. enough when building that application. So what you would need to do in that case is untangle. <laughs> uh, you need to kind of reconstruct and say, hey, let's move the room over here. So now it makes sense to have a room and a bathroom attached instead of having a whole bunch of other things attached and it's just not making sense. So, so, and I, I'm going to say why that's a risk because that when you say reconstruct, that's a cost. That means somebody has to go in and untangle the spaghetti code. And, and add, you know, and that's a risk that, okay, if you go overseas and you don't have somebody who's managing the code base or making sure it's clean code, right, uh, then you run the risk of somebody having to redo it and untangle it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you constantly need somebody, a pair. I would say a pair. It, oftentimes, if you have one person working on the code base and they're not, and then you have everybody else that's not technical, you run that risk unless that person is highly specialized, like me, um, where we can really understand what it takes to create this super organized, uh, highly maintainable, highly scalable code base. All right. So we, we got a little technical here with code bases and but that's, VAs. Yeah, and, that's, and that's all towards cost of application. Yeah. And like you said, it's, it's towards the risk. And the risk, right. right. So, so tell me it's another risk. Um, I, 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 like, I'm in Atlanta, developers in Pakistan. What's another risk? I think one that I see is time zone. Yeah, time zone. Um, so, like, there's a, vi like, people, there's a very risk dealing with, like, a time zone issue where you have to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning just to talk to your development team. That's not scalable, maintainable, because you're not going to be trying to wake up every night, 3 a.m. And some people could, but, you know, it's going to put stress on your life. Uh, you would rather have a team that some people or some 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 organizations would rather have a team where they're waking up at the same and working the same hour so that the communication gap isn't there. 
you don't have to wait, send an email and wait next day for, for stuff to get done. You can get it done instantaneously if you have a, have a team. Yeah. I mean, and it can work both ways. So what I mean by that is ideally you would want people working in your own time zone, but then you can have one or two working off your time zone, like working, you know, the other hours when you're sleeping. So that way you will have a 24 <laughs> seven development yeah, machine. Sure. Yeah. So if you can do it that way, that will optimize everybody's time while they're sleeping, you work in while you work in, they're sleeping and it has, and it will produce this 24 hours around the clock development work, which may reduce risk, right? Because it can reduce the time to be able to produce particular feature sets. Yeah. But the problem is that if it reduces the risk because you have a 24 hour, that's make it, that's assuming that you got somebody working during your time zone and somebody working, yeah. which that means that you have two development teams, yeah. possibly, or three or two, how many shifts it is. So they're working around across shifts, essentially. Like, um, I almost think of it like a shift at a hospital. So they have people working around the clock, but you got to staff that shift, which means that there's more money, less risk, but more money dealing with it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, next thing is like, talk more about this is the last risk when you're going overseas. And I know we, 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 we asked this question and a lot of people, they're interested. Cultural differences. Oh yeah, that's like, a risk. That's a risk nobody ever says when we talk see, about this. And we can give some prime like, examples on that one. And we run across this probably more often than any other of the risk, actually. Um, so this is a risk that overseas developers that we run against. And so let me tell you what the cultural difference is like. For example, I have a I have a developer here in the States. I have a a not developer, a user experience designer, a designer, right? We're in the design step. We're trying to build up screenshots of what the app is looking like, build the user experience, have a designer here in the States, and then I have another designer in India, for example. What tends to happen is that the cultural differences impact the design strategy. Yeah. So, for example, if, if you looked at uh, the Indians, what they see, because like in design, there's this thing called a mental model, and a mental model is essentially... If I say the word book, for example, what do you, what's the picture or image that you see? If I say the word book to Troy, he's going to think of hardback, flip through papers. If I say the word book to my son, who's seven years old or 10 years old, Dylan, then at that point, he's going to see an iPad that you're going to go to a Kindle. He think of Kindle, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we mean by mental model. So the mental model or in here in the States is very different than mental model in, in, in India because the cultural differences of design. And what I mean by that is if you look at the Indians, I just look at the shirt design, right? Um, if you say, Hey, what does a fly Indian look like? Right. He's going to have a burka on all the gold, way. Up. Gold it's going to be gold trim. It's going to be. A, a bright red, bright red and with with a whole purples with patterns on it, and mm -hmm. it's gonna be dope. It'll be dope, but it's gonna be that's what it looks like. It's like yeah, it's it's a, a high pattern, a lot bright pattern design. If you said okay, what does a fly American look like? Then he may go minimalist. He may just throw on a leather jacket, Rolex, you know, and maybe a gold chain and call it a day. Yeah, um, so. That's the difference in like because they have different design patterns that translate into the design work of the actual app. So, for example, what we tend to see is like depending on the the, the culture, they're like a very vibrant, bright, bold design. But American users like a very minimalist, simple, yeah. simple design. Yeah. And so we end up going back and forth more iterations of this design because of the cultural differences. And those, when we go back and forth, and the reason I keep saying back and forth, because the more times you go back and forth, that's the more money that you gotta pay. What may take, you know, to get it right, 20 hours here in India may only take 10 hours here in the States because they get it and they understand the culture, they understand the user, and there's a very different, a different vibe. So I just wanna throw that out there that that is a huge risk that nobody ever talks about. Yeah. Like nobody ever talks about. All right. So we talked about this. Uh, 
Indian versus, oh, I say Indian, but excuse me, outsource developer versus a in, in-state onshore developer. Mm-hmm. What about freelancer versus employee versus agency? What's the difference in cost there? So from an agency standpoint, you are really looking at uh, higher cost structures just because a lot of times they're specialized. Yeah. So you may be looking at it and they have to pay a lot of overhead. Yeah. Right? So the, like, for example, me and Travis, we own an agency, development agency, and we have to pay overhead for the cost of just this building. Or we may have to pay overhead for payroll taxes as an employee. Uh, we may have to pay other different overheads, you know, management, that the management costs, admin costs, accounting. So those are all different overheads that agencies have to pay for. But the benefit is it lowers your risk because they're specialized. They did it tens or dozens of times with other companies and they can do it quickly for you. And that's uh, one of the hedge risk is you may be paying $200 an hour, but it may take you only 10 hours, whereas somebody else. You may pay them twenty dollars an hour, but they may take them two hundred hours. So in our case, if you're paying ten, twenty, two hundred dollars an hour, we're getting it to you faster and maybe even even cheaper over the long run than somebody who's paying you're paying twenty dollars an hour to, who may take much longer. Which getting it to you faster reduces risk. And the same thing for employee, you have a risk of moving from project to project, and if they're an employee then it lowers the risk because now you know that they're only working on your product at mm-hmm. least 40 hours a week. However, they're more costly. So you got to uh, adjust for cost there. So so if we have a uh, somebody that's looking to hire an agency, right? Um, what are some of the things they have to look for to say, okay, this person's worth a $200 an hour t- yeah. ticket? Um yeah, with uh, an agency, you want to look for them tying the workload, like that task by task, with the development team to the higher end goals. Uh, knowing, hey, here's what the strategy is in order to get that return on investment. Okay, since you got that return on investment, uh, here's what we can do. We can put together this particular particular email campaign. We just need to reach this much customers. We can build out this product and we know that it's going to tie to give you this return on investment or probably we can estimate it based on our previous experience that it's going to give you this return on investment. So now they really understand how to tie in that lower level development work to the higher end goals and objectives of your company. And being able to do that is a is a skill set that not too many developers have as freelancers have in general. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of agencies that's been in the game for a while. They also have repositories of code. Oh, yeah. Um, and so what that means is that, like, they built so many apps that when it's time to spin up a login page, login page is th- like, it's something that is in every app, right? Um, when it's time to build in a login page, they can build it quicker than somebody else who's building a login page for the first time because they already built it and they have a pre, it's almost like modular houses. They get a prefabricated code <laughs> that they can just spin it up, right? For like, almost like a modular house, uh, which in- decreases your risk as well. And, and one thing that we do as technical advisors is we can tell you if there's modular code else- elsewhere. So, for example, we may not have the code inside of our agency, but we know, hey, there's a clone for Uber. We can just use that clone to build out your Uber applic- Uber-like Uber application and lower your risk as a entrepreneur and as a tech entrepreneur. So Yeah, so essentially, uh, and Trish said the word clone, because uh, you know, a lot of people may yeah, not know what that clone. is, because that's like a term that we use in our agency. But essentially, we have partners. If we don't have it in our agency, we typically have partners that have code base that have something similar to what you're trying to build. And then we have partnerships where we can easily get access to it um, but relatively quickly. Um, and that will that will allow you to build in half the time. Yeah. Um, and we already pre vetted those partners where we know that they don't have that spaghetti code um, to, to damage the project. Right. Um, so I got a question, sure, because we have some enterprise people out there. And how much does it cost? To be like if I have an app and they're an enterprise client. OK. And w- like, I want to talk through the differences between if, if 
an enterprise client, client came to us and said, hey, move an image one pixel to the left on this app. So you got an app with an image on it and move it one pixel left, left, uh, to the left. What would that cost look like? If they walk me through like how, like the entire process of determining that. All right. So, so first, an uh, enterprise client will have a larger team. So they'll have your business analysts, they have your QA testers, they have, and we talked about all these different types of people. A startup would just have one, one or two people. They'll just move it to the right, test it, deploy it, and they'll do it all themselves. That's, that's a startup. So based on that, you know, maybe it'll take 30 minutes to get the full de deployment for a startup. For a enterprise level company, you got your BA who's going to write up the task to say, move the pistol to the right. Your product owner needs to take the time to move that task up to the top of the list. We call it a backlog. Then you have the front end. You have the designer that's going to design the, the, the image to be shifted. Then you have the front end developer who actually implements it and, and styles it to be one pistol to the right. Then you got your QA tester to test it to make sure that is actually one pistol to the right. The developer then takes that and then puts it into a staging server to get retested and get regression tested, meaning that they're testing that one pistol <laughs> to the right and all the other images. So to sum it all up, then finally you deploy it. And then you have another person, a deployment person that actually sit there and deploy it. So now you have six or seven different people working on moving this one pixel, this image one pixel to the right. So you're looking at about seven hundred dollar ish. Yeah. Cause well, if you look at like the cost of those people, like that hourly cost multiplied, like there is a it may, it may take as what took a startup one hour may take two weeks <laughs> for an enterprise client with all these seven people touching it. Right. Is, yep. it, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, yeah, you're looking, you know, fifty dollars, maybe at most, maybe you know thirty dollars to seven hundred dollars. <laughs> However, I bet on that seven hundred dollars in there. <laughs> yeah, and here's the thing is that I know a lot of people I'll put the money on the seven hundred dollars to be more successful than that than that fifty dollars. A lot a lot of people are asking why. Like why would you why would it be better to bet on the seven hundred and spend the seven hundred than to spend the fifty? Yeah, because what you want when you're building out a, a software product is to be consistent. You want to build out high quality content, high quality features as consistent as possible. And in the 700, they, they, they built out a process to make it as consi consistent as possible. So may, although it may take $700 to build out a, a pistol, you know, it's going to be the highest quality and that reduces your risk. And then on top of that, they can spend the 700 because they already have 50 plus other enterprise clients and put up 50 million. Uh, or so to even build out the application. So it, it makes sense because your returning investment is almost guaranteed as long as you can build out the highest quality application. Whereas if I had somebody who is a startup, they may not have built out those processes yet. And that caused inconsistencies and result in more and more bugs and may not get happy customers or do they even have customers to begin with? So those are things that's going to rec reduce the risk or increase the risk from a startup standpoint and reduce the risk from the enterprise standpoint. So essentially, one more question, because we've been here for 40, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, and I want to keep this down to an hour. One more question. I'm a startup. You know, we got enterprise posts out there. They, they understand, OK, my clients, my, my, my business will put the money, the millions of dollars because we can get the best return and it helps us reduce the risk. We would rather spend the cash than mess up this project. All right. But there's a lot of startups out there as well. Yeah. And I, I want to talk through the differences of costing. Like, let's do a cost together of I got an idea. OK. And I'm trying to get the cost for right now because I, I don't want this to get lost. Yeah. yeah. And they've already did all the business side where they've went out, found people who's interested in, maybe got letters of intent, kind of sign up to an email list or whatever it is. They re they've already, um, you know, done all the legwork to get the investment to come in. So let's talk about two separate apps. Okay. One is 
a very very simple app that's a as a, a, a similar to a similar to an Instagram, right? right? With no with no advertisement, just Instagram post pictures. Show it to my friends. That's it. All right. Then we have a second app that's an Uber ride sharing app. Okay. We'll, All right. We we'll just start with the first one. So let's let's and let's. I'm gonna start. cost it. I cost it off. If I wear a startup, I'll tell you how it cost it. Off. All right. So we're gonna spend five minutes costing out the Uber. And the, I mean, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the, the Instagram, and then we'll spend the last five minutes costing out the Uber. Okay. All right. All right. So Instagram. So I have the login process. Yeah. So so Instagram. So first we're going it. So where are we at? We're going into our four Ds. We're going to for, okay. All right. We're Instagram. at Discovery. Yeah. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a client interview, right? So they're going to have they're going to sit down with a developer development team. And then they're going to we're going to say, hey man, you're a good fit to go ahead and build this roadmap, discovery yeah. roadmap. All right, so now we're going into and that the, cost will be somewhere between a thousand to three thousand dollars. Okay, so we build out. We say, hey, let's go ahead and build the roadmap, thousand to three thousand dollars. Okay, um, in that discovery, we then move into we have to, we had that interview with the client. We then start to ask in that interview. Questions dealing with their app. What are, what are some of those questions we're going to ask? So we're going to ask the feature set of the application. Yep, and, and that's we, the core. Fe- that's the core question because we're trying to understand like how yeah. what features are going to be in, te- in, in, in the app. Yeah. This is like the rooms of your house, the size of the room, how many bathrooms. It's like the base. Okay. Yeah. So then, in that case, if I was to start up, I would say, "Hey, we need a registration, right. a login, login." A uh, page that forgot sees, password. Forgot the yeah, registration login. Forgot password. Yep. Uh, a page to see all the images. Yeah. A page to click on it and yep. see a, a, a comment feed. Yeah. A time, a place to share it. Sure. So I'm I'm I'm, 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 I'm actually throwing the numbers in my hands so I can think. Um, uh, a place to upload it. Yeah. And. You say profile, see the profile and see your profile. All right. So that's the core. So what Troy's did was he built out the core features of an Instagram application. Right. So, so we didn't notice we didn't add live, you know, uh, live streaming. What is it called? Instagram live. <laughs> we yeah, we didn't, add, we didn't add live. We didn't do Instagram stories. We didn't and do Instagram no, no filters in there. No, no filters. You can't go no filters. <laughs> nah, nah, buddy. Um, so we basically built out. So based on those five features, which feature is the highest priority? And, it, and I'm, I'm role playing choice of client. Yeah. And then I'm the actual developer, project manager, program manager, product, you know, to actually help him think through the strategy. So the, the feature that's the highest priority to me would be seeing images. So yep, seeing the my, my, yep. the feed, my images and other people's images, sharing the image. Boom. All right. Out of those two features, no features the same. Which two are the, which one is the highest? Out of those feature features, then I will put sharing higher. You put sharing higher than the feed? Because I would say feed is high, highest. I actually would do feed. I would do feed higher. Right, and right. the reason I say and feed higher than sharing is because you don't necessarily have to have sharing inside. I can just scrape it off the internet somewhere for Facebook or wherever and put it into somebody else's feed. So I don't necessarily have to share. Uh, I can, but I do need to see my other people's images in my own images. Yeah. So. So based on that conversation, I'm asking, and that's the conversation we have. I'm a question his his priority list, at, and that's what a good yeah. Um, and, and see where he corrected me, right? Because a lot of a lot of people don't even yeah, man, know to say, hey man, I think that this may be. And then I had to rethink. I like, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. It would be be the feed, you yeah, know. And that's another risk with going uh, sometimes overseas, depending on who the overseas is, is that because they don't understand what's being built. They're just going to do what you've been told. I mean, yeah. they're do boys. Like they're just going to do it, do it, do it instead of giving you ways to build a better business and build a better product. And that's a risk on having a sorry CTO or <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry leadership team. Yeah, sorry leadership team. They don't know to, to ask those type of questions. They just, yeah. I guess, yes, yes, people, yes, and, yes, yes, men and yes, women, uh, where they yeah. just follow whatever somebody says. Where, whereas in your case, you, you thought through it. 
and was trying to build it all out. Exactly. In your so, head as well. so, so, and so, so we just did the features. So we just so then I'm gonna take it as a as a. So we have as, eight features here. As the uh, product manager, um, so somebody in my agency would take that and say, "All right, let's go ahead and create the the, the 90 day plan, uh, or or our dis uh, discovery documents." Uh, at at that point, we would then take the feature, break it out even further. Sometimes, like, okay, that feed, he said feed, but our developers would say we'll break it out into user stories, and they say user can as a user or a, as a uh you know yeah as a user the you i can have the ability to see a list of feeds so i can be able to see what my friends are doing yeah uh, and so i break that out into ways that the developer can easily understand what to develop what he's going to be developing yeah okay is that a skill set that is a skill set okay what so that's the that's the business analyst okay business analyst so skill okay. set but it also could, if you're trying to consolidate resources from a startup company, the either the, the, the corresponding person that you are corresponding with, that might be the freelancer, or it could, most case, in most cases, it's the entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they exactly. actually build it out, uh, and they're giving it to somebody like a freelancer, and the freelancer looks it over and then makes adjustments to it as well. Yeah. All right. So now I went through, you gave me the features. What's next? All right. So again, that, that process there was probably like one to $3,000, give or take, if you're trying to do your absolute minimum. Then from there, I have these eight feature sets. I'm moving now into the design phase. Yeah. So I have yeah. roughly, it's going to so be. I would say, I would say, and I don't want to cut you off. So would you, would you then estimate? Because in our discovery document, we typically take yeah, those features. So I, yeah. My assumption use. was it was already estimated. Okay, but okay. yeah, yeah. So um, the piece that we will have is a document. It has what we call a backlog. It's broken. Everything's broken all broken out into its own task. It's estimated and mm -hmm. it's broken down into sprints. So estimated means a developer would then take those features and say, "This is how much time that it takes." In order to build those those eight features, he would break it out, and yeah. each feature he would give a cost. Yeah, but it would be the developer, the designer, because there's tasks related to everybody. Yeah, you have designer tasks, you have okay. developer tasks. Yeah. If there's a deployment stage, you have those tasks as well. How you need to deploy it, and so forth. So you're trying to get as much task. Anything that's done by the development team needs to be recorded, yeah. and that's what you're putting into the this list. Okay. Okay. So I have the estimations. I have the development team. I have the roadmap. Okay. Now tell me, tell me what's the next step in the process. So now we broke it all into sprints. So we broke it out into two week intervals or four week intervals, however you want to do it. And we start executing on the task. You have your designer, you have your developer. They may, may, they may be working sequentially or meaning that the designer may design a interface and they'll give it to the developer while the developer is working on let's say the login page the designer may be designing the share page and they're working in, you know sequentially but they're also working in parallel in that sense where they're working together just trying to push out different feature sets okay, so um, that's a, that's one rule as far as reducing your risk is try to get that parallelization the best way, best way you can that's why you have these enterprise companies having eight to ten people because they're independently working on their own items and causing this parallelization going to where they can quickly put out a product really quickly. Whereas if you're working one by one, like, hey, I got to make the designs, myself, especially if it's one person, if you're working, hey, I got to make the designs, then I take a look at the designs, I can now develop it because I'm one person working on it, that's sequentially. And that takes a lot longer than you would if you had multiple resources working on it at the same time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if if I were a designer, then a lot of rule of thumbs, especially for startups, you, you, you want to spend as less money as possible because you don't know you, you're at a higher risk because you don't have enough customers potentially. Uh, then you may want to put a time a, a cap on each design. So maybe in our case, we'll say, hey, a thousand dollars per each design. And that may be your cap. So your design cost may be eight thousand dollars. 
Why did you get 8,000? Because there are eight interfaces. Eight interfaces. Yeah, so okay. there's eight images. There may be more interfaces, but every interface you have, if a designer is designing it, it may be $1,000. you got to account for that back and forth uh, and so forth. So we're looking at, all right, so we did discovery of 1 to 3,000, design each interface. If there's eight features, we're, we're saying, it may not be true, but we're saying that each inter, each feature has its own yeah, and his own interface screenshot or, you know, it, it basically has its own design. And then those features, average, that design work for each one of those features will be eight, eight thousand dollars. Eight thousand. All right. And then that eight thousand dollars, the deliverable is actually what? Like, what is the designer going to give you? So the designer is going to give me a couple of things. They're going to give me a mock up. So that is a visual representation of what it's actually going to look like. And they're going to give me what we call a clickable prototype. So you can be able to click a button on this mock-up and it will kind of simulate the flow. It's going to show, hey, you just move from the login page to the feed page. You move from the feed page to the share page. And that just gives me as a developer, hey, how does the app need to flow? And we call that a clickable prototype. Okay. And then so you finish your clickable prototype. What's next? All right, so it's now time for the development team to start working on it. All right, so push going to shove. If the, if the designer may be not done with the cookable prototype, and the development team can start working on, let's say, the registration process. And that can be done in parallel, so that's one thing to note. And, um, yeah, the, so the development team starts working on both the visual, so converting those designs into... Uh, a HTML document or a web document or okay. maybe a mobile app page. So they actually coding up what it would look like inside of the application. Yeah. So they're actually bringing the designs to life. Bringing them to life. All right. So they're and actually building the app, actual app that can be, the, that can be sent to the iOS store or Android store. Or yeah. Web page. Okay. And you may have, so there's a developer or maybe it may be one developer. Okay. Working on the front end. Yeah. That's the actual visual layout of it coming to life. And you have somebody who's working on the business logic or the back end, hooking up the databases to make sure the right data is stored and the right data is being retrieved back into the application. So you have those two items or those two developers working in parallel or maybe one developer if you're in a startup where he'll be what we call a full stack working on both the back end and the front end. And he can be able to do it as one developer. Yeah. So so in that team for this app, we're building the app. Tell me, like, we're building an app. So aren't there two apps, Android and iOS? Depends. Um, so if you're building the application, if it's an app, you can do Android, iOS, or you can do a hybrid, meaning that you can build it in one code language and it will Deploy out to each of those Android and iOS. So I can have to code once and deploy to both of those stores, or I can code in a native application for iOS is Swift, for Android is Java, uh, and you can just code separately in those two separate code bases, which will double your cost. All right. Um, so a lot of times a strategy is be, Hey, let's just work on this hybrid application. Let's say Ionic is a, it's a, a famous one. React is another one uh, where I can code once and it will deploy out to different stores. So and that can a, save your cost. Android, and, and, so it'll deploy out to Android and iOS. Yeah, Android, iOS, even, you know, if you, if you, you use can. Windows, <laughs> yeah. then you can. Okay, okay. So, so all right, so you, you have a developer. How much does it cost, though? Like, so let's say, for example, we choose to do the hybrid. Meaning that we use a React Native that can be deployed in both iOS and Android. Like, what's the cost, bro? Like, tell me how you determine the cost. All right. So the cost, of course, it depends uh, on the complexity of what you're doing. Like, but we're saying the features. So right now so we're building feature. out the the stream. Like we're building out Instagram, and we're looking through the scroll feature. And right now we're building out the cost for just that. Yep. So I'm, so registration, login, forgot password, put that at about 4,000. I'm, I'm just giving a, a, a rough estimate. So, and how are you coming up with that in your mind? Like, 
Explain so it. I'm looking at each feature and kind of just if, if it's if it requires a what we call crud create re update delete meaning that I'm just trying to uh, if I'm reading data from the database if I'm um, updating data right updating data may be uh, for, uh, there may be registration right yeah. um, I may be deleting data and so forth. Then I'm roughly putting, you know, twelve hundred, okay. fifteen hundred dollars to that. So you're basically based on what you know as how much time is putting in. Then you're basically kind of trying to figure out, yeah, so like how much, how much time times your billable rate, and how much it's going to cost. Is that yeah. how you're doing that? Okay. So that's going to depend. And I know we, we Troy, Troy can give you some of the numbers for us. If you're interested in getting that for your app. Yeah. That's going to depend on your billable rate of whoever you're dealing with. Yeah. So what you'll do is just take that that requirements document, that document where we say we did the estimates towards the steps, and they'll give you an estimate and say, hey, this is going to take eight hours. It's going to take 10 hours. You just multiply that times whatever the developer billable rate is. Okay. And that'll get you how much it will cost That's to build it out. See. So in this case, man, it could range probably. If you're building one feature, there's a stream. But if you're building all, all eight features, um, yeah, then it could be it could be more more more. Yeah. So in this case, if I were to build eight features, I put it at you know yeah. fifteen hundred dollars. Then you're looking at about fifteen thousand dollars for development costs. And that's just a rough. That's yeah. rough. And I because I'm not even I'm doing this not mapping out each number. I'm just kind of throwing numbers out. Yeah. And this is all risky, right? Because if I don't have it written down and have it mapped out, this is it's a risk because yeah. that's why we don't even if you if you hear us talking, we're not gonna ha we have an initial conversation with a, a client, potential client, we'll never put the numbers out. Uh just because Or if we did and they're pressing, we'll give them a large range. Yeah, we'll give them a large range. So we'll say, ah, it's gonna be about, you know, if you really need numbers, ballpark. You know, somewhere between fifteen and a hundred thousand. Yeah, just because <laughs> we don't have a written version of what they're saying. Oftentimes, they'll give us an idea, and then they will add all. Once they have it written down, they will add all these bells and whistles and whistles and features and all these different things, which cause it very difficult to scope initially. And if we were to say, "Hey, it's going to cost fifteen thousand dollars," and then you give us this feature with a filter and artificial intelligence inside of it. And then we were to say, oh no, that's going to be thirty thousand. Then you're going to say, hey, I thought you said fifteen thousand, but we didn't incorporate all these other features that you just mentioned. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so that's why we don't say it initially because it's risk on our side to give numbers in the initial conversation when we don't have the full requirements or full backlog scoped out. All right. So you 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 got the developer, you know, range fifteen thirty thousand. Now, what's the last step? We went through so far this discovery, design. Now we're in development, coming out of development. Where do you go from there? Now you move into deploy. Okay. Um, testing yeah. is included into that development. Oh, um, is so it in, in development or deployment? Oh, okay. Yeah, it would be inside of, it would probably be inside deployment more so uh, because you always need to test whether that be automated, uh, which is, we'll get, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> or whether it be a phys manual, meaning that there's somebody physically clicking through the application and testing the application. Is that important? Very important. Probably okay. the most important. Almost. So this is the number one, I would say, probably the number one risk with like small team startup isn't like it's usually not the developer. And a lot of like a lot of small startups will blame it on the developer. But it's actually the process at which they manage the developer. Yeah. And so a lot of small startups tend to skip the quality assurance and making sure the app is quality when the developer says yeah. it's done. Um, and then they either let another founder do it and they don't really do it well or um, they don't do it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Quality assurance. Like I said, in order to lower risk, you need to have the highest quality. Yeah. And that means quality insurance is a must. That means you have to have thorough, thorough testing, thorough. And that's a cost. 
and it's costly. <laughs> I mean, it's not costly, but it's cost. Um, yeah. Yeah. So somebody needs to go cost? in and test it. And in a small startup, startup, it should not be, and this is a common misconception, it should not be the developer. Yeah. Most times, as Travis mentioned, it's the developer doing the testing. And then when they, it's buggy, they blame the developer because they was responsible for testing as well. When it never should have been in their responsibility at all to do the testing. They should do their own testing, yeah, to make sure it's quality, but then there should be a third party tester to verify. Yeah. And oftentimes that should be the business team. If, if it's a very small team, it should be, if it's you and a, and a, and a, a CTO or a technical co-founder, then it should be you as the business person and going in and testing to make sure everything uh, is smooth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so after testing, um, and first off, the testing, how much cost is that usually? I yeah, I would always me and me and Travis. We always factor in two weeks. Yeah, two weeks of testing. If, if, if this is eight feature, this eight feature product, two weeks is a good is a, is a good margin for testing. If it's larger, if it's of course it expands as you get larger. If it's sixteen features, of course you need more than two weeks. So you have to be cognizant of how much features you have compared to how long your testing should be. Yeah. yeah. So two weeks. Eight hours, you know, we're looking at 2000 2000 yeah. 2000 Okay. All right. So then in the last step after testing, got a quality product, tester verified. This is some great work, development team. What's the last step? The last step is you. we in this deployment stage. Somebody got to architect it out. Somebody got to build out the servers to be able to make sure that it's publicly available. When you're developing, you may just have it on your local machine. You may have it on your your, your, your your Mac computer. You may have it only on your iPhone. But somebody has to make sure that it's publicly available and it's deployed. That's what we call it. Deployment, meaning that it's publicly available to all who needs it. So you move it from your your private computer or phone to, for example, the App Store. Or if you, in this case, because you got a front-end and back-end developer, then you also got to deploy it to the publicly available server so that the app can communicate with the database. Correct. Okay. And that process, it depends. But when you're starting off, you know, it, it may not take as much because you're trying to just get it out and get a, it, get the product deployed and be public available. But it may not be scalable, meaning that, yeah, it's publicly available to a hundred people simultaneously who's working on it simultaneously, but it not be, it may not be publicly available to 10,000 people who may be on the app simultaneously. So initially you may just target a hundred people because you're trying to do some type of pilot or focus group or whatever you're trying to do. If that's the case, I'll put 10 to 20 hours on. Okay. If you get so it. Add another thousand. So, yeah. Yeah, another All right. Thousand. So, so right now, just to build the Instagram app version one, you got 3000. 3,000 for discovery design. We said 8,000 ish. 8,000 ish. So that's 12. It's 11. Oh, that's 11,000. Okay. 15,000 for and development. Development 15,000. So that's 26. 26. And then deploy the testing. The you testing. Another three to five. I should say three. Let's just keep it 3,000. 29. 29. And then another thousand for deployment. So we had a 30,000. 30, dollars Thirty thousand dollars. That's high, and that'll give you a decent quality application. A decent quality app. So the question I know a lot of people are thinking right now is like, man, thirty thousand. Good oh gracious, a life. So, Ooh. what type of like, when would a person need to spend thirty? Like, I don't have. I, like, why would I be okay with spending thirty thousand? Like, if I spend thirty thousand, man, I don't want to end up in a situation where I gotta, you know, sell my first kid. To build an app, I mean, what, 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 like, what makes thirty thousand doable? Because some people out there are saying thirty thousand ain't bad. Thirty thousand not bad. That's not bad for an app, man. I mean, I'm used so, to spending yeah. five hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So, what's the difference in that person? So again, um, one of the understanding the risk. So you want to understand that, hey, if I spend thirty thousand, it's going to give me three hundred thousand. Yeah. So if 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 how do I spend thirty thousand 
to give me three hundred thousand. So let me let me let me brew this home because we got to get to the Uber and then call it a day because we're, we're we're running really really long. Um, so if you can be guaranteed that if you spent thirty thousand, that there is a a high likelihood, let's just say, you know, above fifty percent that I can make a hundred thousand, then would you spend a thirty thousand? And that's the question that a lot of people are asking. Or, and how much does it hurt? Like that matters. It does. Like it matters that. Okay, not only what's the reward, can I get to 100, but if I lose the 30,000, how much would hurt? That's the risk. And that's what we keep bringing back risk and reward. Yeah. So a lot of people, to, to overcome the hurt, they are borrowing. Yeah. So they won't use it out of their own pocket. They raise They'll the money. They'll say, hey, you know, 30,000 is a little bit too much out of my own pocket. Let me just raise 1,000 from here, 3,000 from him, 5,000 from him. So now it's a distributed risk. <laughs> yeah, uh, I may only spend you one thousand, but I know I may get you say a hundred thousand, so I may spend one thousand. So, but I may know I get four thousand in another year, which that may be rewarding to me if I know that you, if I know you as a person, I know you. If you say it that you're gonna do it and it's gonna work out, yeah. Um, and which also lowers your risk. Okay. So I just want to make sure that, like, even though some people out there may think thirty thousand is a lot, other people out there think it's not as much at all. And there's ways to reduce it. And then the, the other people are thinking, okay, how do I make sure, ensure that I can get the return back? Yeah, and that's what mindset you should be thinking when you're making any investment, not just a nap investment. Yeah, and I was just mentioning that there's ways to reduce down to thirty thousand if you want to even go even further. Right. And mean, like, I reduce it, the, the actual the, cost. The cost from 30000 to, let's say, 15000 Yeah. 15000 to 10000 And I kind of lead that up to Travis to, uh, to throw some ideas, right? You yeah. have you have the existing code base that we mentioned. So you make and borrow. Yeah, you can use our partners. Like, for example, we have partners, and the partners say, oh, I already built an uh, uh, Instagram app. Hey, man, just use my code base. I sell it to you guys for 5000 10000 and then we just come in, organize it, deploy it, test it, and make that may be modified. Make some, make some tweets, so that may be additional fifteen five thousand, right? So ten thousand by the code, five thousand to tweak it, deploy it, test it, and then we got we just reduced it down to fifteen thousand dollars. Yes. So those are some of the strategies. If you um, join the Ultra Accelerator, we're going to give you. I mean, we got about ten to twenty of them. Yeah. Um, that 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 can help you reduce your cost down. I mean, we may can get it down to five thousand for an app that's a hundred thousand, depending on some of the strategies we use. All right, so last last question, and we're not gonna go deep into like the whole entire process of Uber, because but what is the difference between an Uber and an Instagram? So, like, and why would the cost be different? Uber is what we call a multi marketplace application. Yeah, multi-user market market multi-user so with instagram i just have one user that's the person uploading and reading images <laughs> uh, but then if i'm a uber type user then you have your driver yep, that's one user that's a user so that's the, the person that's going to get the request i'm the person you have the person requesting to okay. use the vehicle then you may also have an, a dispatcher that's Making sure that everything is smooth and making sure the algorithms are working as far as where the vehicles should be placed. You may have an admin user. So you may have these different users using the application and that increases your cost significantly. Oh, wow. You're essentially creating multiple applications. Mm. All right. So the, what the driver sees is different, totally different from what the drivee or the, the user the sees, the yeah. passenger sees. Right. Um, so you have to calculate that inside of your cost when you're making an application. So what was only eight features, maybe eight features for the driver, eight features for the passenger, eight features for the dispatcher. And because you're now building multiple features for multiple users, there's a different, there's a lot more cost that could be, uh, that, that, that could be evolved. Yep, exactly. Cool, cool. All right, so that sums up how much does an app cost. I know this was a very lengthy video, but we, we put it all on lot. Put it all on lot. We, um, we gave you all the knowledge. We dropped, dropped bombs. <laughs> you need to know 
like if you watch this video in its entire in its entirety, like this is probably going to be the top video from a content standpoint of everything you needed to know to determine the cost of an app. Yeah, man. It's, uh, we went through the personnel, the difference between outsourcing. It's just, yeah. How does an enterprise see it how versus does a our startup? Enterprise see it versus a startup. We went through the entirety, the gamut, features, process. People, everything that you need to strategies know. Strategies even to reduce it down. The strategies to reduce it we down. Reduce down Minimum the cost. viable product terminology and that whole entire movement of the lean startup all the way down to how agile works. We've done it. We did it all. Quality assurance. Yeah. So, so if, if you're still here, <laughs> um, and you want to get our process of how we develop applications that can reduce your cost. Okay, we do it. We do a four step. We talk about the four D's, but then there's a couple of steps we put in there to help you help help you reduce costs and build market and reduce risk, right? Um, that we put in there as well. So the entire in our entirety is a four step product development cost, and then we have a four step like go to market strategy that we combine, like we said before, to make sure your your return is maximized and your reduce is minimized, right? Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in getting that, um, we are scheduled call. Uh, we are, uh, accepting, uh, you know, sessions for, for consulting to, to actually craft up and give you that in what we call our 90 day plan. It's our ultra accelerator framework to build apps in 90 days that can get you a return of investment. Yeah. All right. And if you've seen this on YouTube or Facebook, man, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you subscribe. <laughs> subscribe, like us. And if you have any questions, put it in the comments below and we'll get to it as fast as we can. We all about sharing the knowledge, giving it to you and helping you grow. And that's what we all about with the tech twins. All right. So let's go ahead and schedule for that call. Share, like, subscribe and tech twins out.